नमस्ते जय हिंद वेलकम टू अनदर एडिशन ऑफ द ए एन आई पॉडकास्ट विद स्मिता प्रकाश दिस एपिसोड इज बींग फिल्म इन न्यू डेली ऑन द साइड लाइन्स ऑफ द रायसीना डायलॉग ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फोर The Raisina Dialogue is India's premier multilateral conference which brings in business leaders, politicians, thought leaders from around the world to ideate. This episode deals with post-election scenario in Pakistan, the political and economic crisis, the dysfunction within that which is a threat to its neighbors. Thank you gentlemen. Thank you Leslie. Uh I have your permission by addressing you uh to address you by your first names. So thank you for that. Um I'll begin with you Ambassador uh, okay Ajay. <laughs> I'll begin with you Ajay. Uh you uh you've been in those who don't know uh Indian High Commissioner to Pakistan, a distinguished fellow observer research foundation. So since we're going to be talking everything about Pakistan perfect person to begin with, you've written this book called Anger Management that looks at the troubled diplomatic relations between India and Pakistan. How do you see the current situation in Pakistan, the absolute chaos that has happened post election? Well I think uh, what we're seeing in Pakistan right now is a bit of a battle between the old Pakistan as we knew it and the new Pakistan which was trying to emerge but clearly the old Pakistan has won mm-hmm. so what we had on the 8th of February were elections which were heavily rigged and it was clear to everyone within Pakistan and out of Pakistan that they were really rigged elections with a lot of pre-election engineering a lot of in-election rigging and continuing with a lot of post-election adjustment and clearly uh, what we have at the end of it uh, emerging is a hybrid government uh, of the kind uh, Pakistan is getting used to because mm. uh, with 2018 and the Imran Khan government that was a hybrid government as well So what we are possibly seeing is a hybrid 3.0. Uh, we had a 16 month government after Imran Khan was eased out. The template remains the same. Uh but what was really clear and what was new is that uh, Pakistan was going through a very severe economic crisis which was hitting the people in unimaginable ways and uh the second issue that was clear was that there was a wave that was anti army a uh, pro uh, sympathy wave for Imran Khan and a basic anti establishment vote which was manipulated to make it appear like uh, uh, you know uh, to change the outcomes the outcomes are exactly what the army wanted which is a government with uh, possibly Shahbaz Sharif would be leading it mm-hmm. as prime minister and the PPP would be a junior partner possibly contributing the president which is Zardari What do you have to say to this very cute and charming comment from uh, China appreciating the election and uh, admiring them for holding peaceful and uh, successful polls? Well, because I think China has no illusions about uh, where Pakistan is going and how it is run, and nor does, for that matter, the rest of the world. Because mm. the I think the criticism has been pro forma, and uh, the, for the reason that. uh the bar is set very low for pakistan's democracy and for china i would guess well for certainly <laughs> for china but even for western democracies the mm. bar is low because the fact that elections are held is is a relief the fact that uh, the army doesn't take over in a coup is a relief so uh beyond that uh, the them being heavily rigged seems to be something people are accepting globally Thank you. Uh Jeffrey I'll come to you. Um mm. as uh, uh for those who don't know former chairman European Parliament delegation for relations with India that's how we know him as a former India hand as a China India um and uh Asia watcher. Um and as a senior British military intelligence officer and then as a politician how do you view uh, what has happened in pakistan the elections and uh, the collapse of and you know the collapse of anything uh, to do with successful democracy this continuous tumult that one is seeing out there how do you see that for the region well i mean i think it's very worrying i mean pakistan's in danger of becoming a failed state and it's not in anybody's interest either regionally or globally that this should happen we need stability uh we need proper democracy in uh in a country like pakistan i mean it has been described as the most dangerous country on earth mm-hmm. um why do they say that well obviously it's a country with nuclear weapons 
It's a country that has spawned terrorism. Uh, it's a country with a very unstable government. And this uh, election, the outcome is really not very clear. It's you know, obviously the old dynastic parties have been rejected by the electorate. Uh, they wanted Imran Khan. He fell out with the military and say so he's now in jail. And I think, and the military, what's really worrying actually, the, in the background, you've always had the military were, if you like, a feature of stability. Mm. That if things were going to go too wrong, they were there and just corrected. Now I think public confidence in the military has eroded as well. And so there is no established structure in the country that the public have confidence in. And I think one of the developments, and we're all actually in all of our countries are faced with this, is your ability to control uh, what people think through um, media, through social media. Um, and now we're getting... Uh, you know, all these videos which are totally changing people's attitudes and their knowledge about things and their lack of trust and the inability to determine exactly what is the truth. And I think these are problems which uh, were features of this election, um, but they affect all of us. So I think the situation in Pakistan is very worrying. As a Brit, of course, we have um, one and a half million uh, British people of Pakistani origin in our country. What happens in Pakistan is very important um, because they are influenced by what goes on here. And we want the right sort of messages to be coming to them. Um, so I, I think all around, it's the most worrying situation. So for us sitting in India, we've always seen that, you know, this Anglo-American alliance of sorts, Pakistan has always been their favorite child. Is that still the case? I don't think that's, that was the case at all. I or think, is there a waning of interest? Well, I mean, I think if you go right back to the beginning, there were concerns. Don't forget, we're talking when India uh, gained her independence, um, with the, it was the beginning of the Cold War. India at that time seemed to be very much aligned with what we regarded as the wrong side in the Cold War, very much aligned with the Russians and all of that. And Pakistan seemed at that time, and I'm going back now to the late 40s and early 50s, Pakistan seemed to be uh, a potentially more reliable ally. But then we saw, you know, wind right the way through and to 9-11 in America, uh, and then the reactions to that and the way things have gradually fallen apart in Pakistan ever since. And the fact that Pakistan is now the uh, foremost client state of China. Mm. Uh, it is totally under Chinese influence there. And that's another worrying development, which has hardly been mentioned in this whole electoral uh, discussion. But... Um, so uh, this idea that, yes, of course, the West, we have concerns, we have interests. Uh, we want to see a better relationship between Pakistan and India. Mm. But I think for a long time we've recognized that, of course, the country that we really want our friendship with is India. That's what I've spent my political life uh, uh, proselytizing uh, mm. on that particular aspect and uh, it was never truer than today. I'm going to come on to that with uh, Leslie. Uh, Leslie Vindramuri, Director US and America's Program, Chatham House and Professor of International Relations, SOAS University, London, UK. Uh, so I'm going to pick this up, uh, you know, what I got from Jeffrey, but now India suddenly becoming the favorite child and Pakistan becoming the client state of uh, China or the the foremost client state. If, am I right? And uh, is that what yeah, you said? I yes. Think if you look around the world, it is the country the, that is most influenced. Most influenced. So, would you like to take that? No, absolutely. I mean, I think Pakistan creates a a very serious problem for the United States. Uh, the United States, uh, in its relationship with India, has flourished. It's grown 
for multiple reasons. Clearly, there's a strategic imperative there, the concern with China's rise, India being now the largest country in the world, the um, third largest military spender, the fifth largest economy. It's strategically of great significance, but there's also that holding and that sharing of democracy and a sense of values. They're not entirely aligned, but they're but they're largely overlapping. And when you look at Pakistan, it looks the story looks very, very different. Uh, mm. uh, the military, obviously, having extraordinary power, um, a country in which America has deep concerns about uh, it hosting uh, terrorism. That you know, ever since the global war on terror, I think the concern for Pakistan. Um, if you add on to that the sense of you know a major nuclear power that isn't stable um, that has now high levels of indebtedness, um, the flooding, so you get environmental problems, developmental problems. And so the U.S. on the one hand wants to be able to speak to those to, to create more stability, but has this deep sense of competition with Pakistan because of the, the U.S.-China relationship, mm. um, has a real concern on the democracy and human rights agenda. And of course, has you know, ha is developing and very much focused on um, the, the more, the far more important relationship in the region, which is with India. And what we're seeing now, there are some voices seeing, saying uh, in in the U.S. Uh, that are saying we need to have a reset. That the U.S. needs to reinvest in its relationship with Pakistan. Needs to really up its development assistance to stabilize as much as possible. Um, not least to mitigate against climate-related um, migration flows, but especially against any potential terrorist threats. But the U.S. is distracted. Mm. It's, you know, at one level, it would like to focus on China. In fact, it's distracted by the war in the Middle East, which is yeah. <laughs> further away from Pakistan. It's very much focused on transatlantic security. And it has its own election coming up. So mm. I think that, you know... Waning of interest, would say? Well, I think it's, you know, it, it is the... There's, there's always been a little bit of a sense of it's potentially a ticking time bomb. Mm. But there's so many reasons to be frustrated um, and to find Pakistan very, very difficult for and, the U.S. to invest in. And also what Ajay said about Imran Khan, uh, you know, this this anxiety now that, you know, he's probably won the election, but we are stuck with a coalition uh, which is not Imran Khan. And we are seeing street protests, as you said, social media. Now, that's that's happening even in the U.K. It's happening in London, people coming out in the streets. Um, so... Do you see the street applying pressure on what we always thought was that the army will suddenly step in and control everything and then put somebody in charge? But is the street now uncontrollable there? Well, I think for Pakistan, you know, you, you might wish to speak to that. And when I'm looking at it from a U.S. perspective, what it what it does is it just it makes it very complicated. President Biden, as we know, entered office wanting to see the world through the lens of democracy versus uh, autocracies. He has stepped back on that dimension, but it's still very difficult yeah. to support a country that's so clearly restricting freedom to vote. That's where the elections are have been deeply fraught, where you see people on the street. And, and America has to contend with this, that in many countries this is happening, where street protests have become, whether it's on immigration in Europe, whether it is in Pakistan, anywhere you're seeing, you're seeing it even in Canada, that these kind, the truckers' protests which are happening in many places, uh, that these street protests are taking such a violent turn and America has to deal with it in its own land too, Absolutely. right? And so uh, democracies have to press reset buttons on how they're going to be tackling with this. Do you agree with that? I do. And I think the, the place, of course, where this is playing out the most is with the uh, war in Gaza. This is, yeah. it, it's playing out in the streets, especially in the college, university campuses in the United States, where there are, where there's great division um, and where there is a young generation in U.S. politics that, that have a strong, a much stronger sympathy for the Palestinians than was previously the case. Uh, and they're also watching on the on the Arab streets the the sort of yes. the call for the U.S. to push Israel to restrain its mm. uh, its use of force. And so, uh, Pakistan, many countries around the world, um, this is a you know, it's not entirely new. This has been developing for some time. But yes, you can't diplomacy is no longer about public officials only speaking to yes. each other. That has that democratic element, even in illiberal states. 
um, there's a sense of democracy on the street in which people, m- leaders must engage with that. Ambassador Basari, I'm going to come back to you. You know, the I- Indian External Affairs Minister recently said that Western countries have long preferred to supply arms to Pakistan and not India in the past decade. That has changed. But India can't be expected to abandon its old friends who were supplying arms at one point of time. Um we would, uh, Jeffrey just said that Pakistan was a reliable partner. Reliable partner, most Indians say that it was a reliable partner because we weren't considered a partner. We were rebuffed at that stage, but there's a view, that's another view. Um, so tell us uh, about this, whether the world has to come to terms with the fact that uh, we will not abandon Russia, which was willing, willing to sell us arms when we needed it most. Yes, but first, uh, on the point that Leslie made, I think, you know, democracies learn to deal with dissent. That is what democracy is about. But in Pakistan, it's not really a democracy. It's the army, which will try to quell this dissent with force and manipulation. But, you know, on on your question about um, India having uh, those choices, historically, Pakistan uh, made itself useful uh, to the West through its geostrategic salience. And, you know, it was a useful ally of the West in the Cold War, in the Afghan War, in the War on Terror. And uh, it was collecting, in a sense, geopolitical rents for where uh, it was. Mm. And suddenly those rents have begun to dry up, uh, at, at least since 15th August 2021, when the U.S. withdrew uh, from Afghanistan. And uh, which adds to the poly crisis that Pakistan faces today. Mm. But, you know, to the point that you mentioned historically, um, those were Cold War years. And certainly what India found was that the West was and the U.S. were favoring uh, the uh, Pakistan, including at times when it was at the height of uh, being run by dictators, you know, whether it was the Nixon-Kissinger duo's bet on Pakistan in 1970, mm. or with Ayub Khan, or uh, with General Ziaul Haq uh, to fight the uh, 70s, um, 79 to 89 Soviet uh, uh, jihad. So in all these times, India found that the West was kind of favoring mm. Pakistan, and there was used to be a hyphen in those days. Mm, yeah. So, uh, you know, naturally, India was maximizing its security in the ways that it found fit. Um, but the world is changing now. Mm. So, um, so uh, that is a legitimate grouse from India about the past. But uh, I think if you look at today, it's a Pakistan which is dysfunctional and of less strategic. Uh, relevance uh, to uh, most Western powers. Would you agree with that, Uh, that it's less strategic? I'd see it the other way around, you see. I (laughs) I don't see it at all that um, somehow or other we were rejecting India and favoring Pakistan. I think India rejected us. That was the problem. I think the uh, India in the, uh, the height of the Cold War got into bed completely with the Russians. No, I can understand some of the reasons for that, because Russia proved to be a reliable strategic ally when others seemed to be a bit flaky. I understand that when India had a time of need um, and she needed a reliable supplier of weapons and things like that. But it's because India got so deeply in bed with the Russians. And I first came to India in the 1970s um, and, of course, everything was Russian. And the, the uh, Russians are still India's largest defense suppliers. And they're deeply embedded here. That's the point. And you've only got to read something like that fascinating uh, book, The Mitrokin Archives, just to see the extent to which Russia focused its efforts on India and on dis- disinformation producing bogus letters that are supposed to have been written by either the Americans or the Brits, putting us all in a bad light. And all these things were put out there and they were totally false. These were KGB operations aimed against the West. So I think, you know, India became suspicious of the West. They were deeply in bed with the Russians. 
Um, and naturally, therefore, we were concerned, well, okay, if we share our high-tech weaponry, what's going to happen to this? Does it go then straight to Moscow or whatever? So, I, I, you know, don't blame us. I think at that stage, and I'd like to think things have, have changed somewhat now. But, and I, can I just say mm, one other sure. thing? And that is, India attaches a lot of importance to values. Now, if that is the case, and if it is still the case, how can she look at a country like Russia, which has invaded another country uh, and created such mayhem in the Ukraine and disturbed the peace of Europe, why doesn't India use her influence with Russia uh, to say, look, come on, we can't go on being supportive if you go on in this way, you have to find a different way out of this. And we don't hear that at all. Um, I'm no one to defend uh, because I'm just a moderator, but I yeah. would say this, that uh, India has never been expansionist, but has seen expansionist policies, whether from colonial powers in Britain, whether from China, whether from Russia. We've seen the colonial tendencies from everybody, the expansionist tendencies. So... Um, I think uh, it's self-interest that determines and whether it was in the 70s uh, and India was a playground not just for the KGB, for the CIA too, uh, in the 70s and continues mm. to be even today. Mm. So um, to keep that aside, if I was to just get to you, Leslie, about, um, you know, what we are seeing now uh, with Afghanistan, what's happening from there, where the Taliban saying, threatening Pakistan, that they will see something like a balkanization of Pakistan happening, uh, another Bangladesh maybe, because of what is happening with the Durand line. Um, Taliban saying that we don't accept the Durand line, we've never accepted the Durand line. So you have two million Afghans sitting in Pakistan, not knowing where to go, what's going to happen to them. So what's going to, how does America see this now? Because that's another potential uh, explosion that is waiting to happen. Absolutely. And I think, again, the, 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 the problem for the U.S. right now is that there is a, the sheer overwhelming load um, that sits in one sense on America's shoulders because it is the largest military power. There's an expectation that it has built up for itself to solve many problems. And it's, you know, demonstrated that its ability to solve problems is actually limited. Mm. And, and, and then, you know, the second part of that is that the, the core, even though there's this overwhelming um, sense that the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, regardless of the fact that many people supported it, was executed. Messy. It was chaotic. It was far yeah. worse than chaotic. It was humiliating um, for the country. It was uh, it was devastating for Afghans and for the region, it was destabilizing, but the, but the U.S. quickly moved on yeah. and it quickly moved on first, you know, to the Indo-Pacific and then quickly back to the transatlantic because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And now when it looks to the Middle East, it's looking at hmm. Iran, Israel, Palestine, Gaza, and um, it's very hard, even though there's a clear awareness of the instability, which could become, you know, very consequential. Uh, it, it, the investment is still limited because there is a sheer lack of human resource to dedicate to to these crises. And God forbid that we would see in Afghanistan or in Pakistan the moment that brings us back in in the way that we saw yeah. on October 7th and subsequently um, in Israel and, and then in Gaza. And in, in an election year, I'm guessing that there's more inward looking, uh, which is happening in uh, in the US, because uh, who has the time or the energy to look at uh, yet another uh, area blowing up, right? I mean, that, that is historically what has proved to be the case. But in fact, right now, foreign policy is really top of the agenda, not only for the White House, for the U.S. Congress, which is, you know, as we know, obstructing a lot of efforts yeah. or fighting within itself. For the allocation for of the budget allocation, for Ukraine. Exactly. Yes. For Ukraine, which also means for, you know, for Israel, for Taiwan, yeah. um, for the border. 
Um, but it is foreign policy is top of the agenda of many, many parts of the U.S. foreign policy establishment, mm -hmm. even in an election year. And this might be the, you know, the one election year that bucks the trend where actually foreign policy, foreign policy. features in the minds of many voters. And right. when it when it does, it will probably be about the Middle East, but it won't be about Afghanistan and Pakistan. I'm going to take that uh, back to you, uh, Ajay, about, um, about the Taliban's threat. That is the latest thing that we're hearing now. Um, that strategic depth that was happening, that never happened for Pakistan, right? They were looking at it as a backyard, uh, as an extension of their own country. And their benefactor, Imran Khan, is sitting in jail. So what happened to that now? Yeah, so, you know, Pakistan always had this strategic culture of talking of strategic depth with Afghanistan. And the hollowness of that idea was proven in the last couple of years because 15th August 2021, they uh, felt that they could do these deals with the Taliban mm. along three lines. They, they said, one, please recognize the Duran line. Two, please uh, ask the TTP or don't give them safe havens to attack us in Pakistan. And three, get the Indians out. Now, and two years later, guess what? None of those uh, proved to be correct or uh, the Taliban was not on board. So um, India again was back with a coordination mission. The Duran line is something that uh, the, the Afghans would never agree don't anyway. agree with. There's this whole Pashtun this Punjabi history, yeah. conflict, uh, historical conflict that goes on. And the TTP, uh, when uh, Pakistan approaches uh, the Taliban, they say, they're your people. Have a dialogue with them. We have mm -hmm. nothing to do with it. So I think on all those fronts, uh, Pakistan feels that uh, clearly it has not been a successful project. And at this point of time, its relations with Afghanistan, with the Taliban, are at a low. As indeed with Iran, uh, we saw attacks from Iran uh, for the same reason that um, Afghanistan was upset, that there were safe havens and sanctuaries uh, within uh, Pakistan against the Iranians. So I think uh, we, uh, Pakistan certainly feels that that was uh, a failed project or something that hasn't worked well. And now with a new government, I think this is something they would focus on. But, you know, I just also wanted to mention something about what Jeffrey said uh, about the 70s. Uh, you know, if you just look at the 1971 moment, uh, that was when the U.S. was busy building this bridge to China. And, and ignoring a genocide in East Pakistan because that wo Cold War play was more important to the U.S. at that God time with Kissinger, Nixon right? Let's and talk. Kissinger <laughs> than doing it. And that was the context in which India went in for the Indo-Soviet Treaty to ensure that in the 71 war, uh, the U.S. doesn't jump in supporting Pakistan and, and the Chinese don't jump in as well. So uh, I think historically, there have been many, many uh, factors contributing to this. And uh, you might argue that uh, one side or the other favored, uh, you know, other partners. But clearly now, India is, uh, has uh, diversified its friendships and, you know, is multi-aligned in a way that India wants to get the best out of its friends, both in terms of its values and its uh, interests. Correct. Uh, uh, Jeffrey, I'm going to come to you. Um, you know, uh, you have this expertise in uh, on terror. You, uh, was it the MBE that uh, uh, that you were awarded when you yes. were what, 27 or something? Yes. If I yes. if I yes. click from <laughs> the 2023 Raisina pod, yeah. I remember reading about that at that time. That yeah. uh, that was when the Irish situation was like dealing with. Uh, you were dealing with terror issues. Yes, and uh, so. Let's focus on the terror part about uh, on Pakistan when we deal with that. Yeah. Um, and when we see that there are several war theaters which are happening simultaneously. One had thought that uh, after COVID, uh, people would realize that wars are not the way to go. But there's like it's blowing up, whether it's Ukraine, Iran. Uh, we're talking about Pakistan now, which would also could also spiral downwards. So is this... Is the war on terror that started off and one thought it was ending, has it turned into a more lethal phase now? Well, I think uh, people look around the world, and I'm sorry to say, but they think, oh, well, terrorism has been successful uh, in many parts of the world. Uh, one, I think, interesting parallel, you mentioned the Northern Ireland thing. Um, terrorists like to have a sanctuary. Mm. Um, 
and a contiguous sanctuary, ideally. And of course, in Northern Ireland, they used the Republic. And that's where they were based. They had their logistics center. Yeah. Uh, they recruited and trained and all of that. And provided they didn't do their terrorism in the Irish Republic, there was a blind eye to their activities cross-border into the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland. You, you've seen uh, an element of that now with uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Um, you see, there was this duplicitous element. I'll, I'll come on to that perhaps, but cross-border. In other words, you had uh, Taliban and, and uh, Al-Qaeda carrying out operations, but using the safe haven of Pakistan. Um, mm. And, of course, what we now know is, uh, um, very dramatically, is that the leadership of the Taliban and, indeed, the leadership of uh, al-Qaeda were all that time sitting in Pakistan. Uh, so, on the one hand, within Pakistan, you have this um, anti-terrorism that was going on, uh, seemed to coincide with what the Americans and British and that were doing on one side of the border in Afghanistan. On the other side, the Pakistanis were pushing back up into the um, uh, Fatah area and to the northwest frontier provinces, into that area, uh, but at the same time um, playing host in Quetta, uh, and about a bad uh, to leaderships of terrorist organizations. So, and continuing the jihad on the eastern front yeah, in India. Like, well, and this was the other aspect, you see, that the army getting concerned that if they start now putting all their assets into a drive against terrorism in the eastern part of the country, um, what about, uh, I'm sorry, in the western part of the country, what about what our eastern border with India, you see? And that's, uh, they thought, oh gosh, we're going to be weakened there. So I think the army was very concerned about this counter-terrorism aspect and wanted, of course, to keep a main focus on its uh, conventional and other capabilities. So, um, yeah, a lot, to, a lot to play for. But again, trust, you see. Mm -hmm. There was a double game being played. And we see this so often. Uh, Leslie, I'll come to you. Uh, is there exhaustion in uh, the American public on, you know, because one is seeing that it's being held back, the, the aid package is being held back. And there are several research, uh, Pew Research also has come out. People are exhausted with uh, giving money to fight, whether it is in Ukraine. And even with the Taiwan situation, it was like, no, don't get into it. Let's not, uh, let's not push China to such an extent. Let's have more talks going on and the rest of the world is looking up and watching uh, that if the the messy uh, getting out from Afghanistan, not wanting to get involved in uh, resolving conflicts around the world, staying away from all this, is that going to impact in any manner the next government which comes in, the next administration which takes over? Is it going to be determined a lot for, uh, by public pressure? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would contest that a little. I think it's a very good question, but I would sort of turn it a bit. I think um, we underestimate and undervalue the role of leaders and leadership in driving public opinion. Uh, you, If you make a very strong, serious case based in evidence, but also in values um, that's realistic, you can you can persuade the American people to support many things. If instead you have what the U.S. has now, which is a U.S. Congress that has been captured by around eight uh, radicalized Republicans, very far in the right, who really have, you know, gained a lot of um, space with their arguments that are anti-U.S. support for Ukraine, um, that were focusing on immigration and border security, but are now, you know, sort of pushing back on that support. Um, then I think it becomes just very hard to move the system. The American people still, you know, are quite committed to NATO. They believe in America's global role. There is a sense that, you know, the debt is high and the, the, the bills are high. And, you know, we have a lot of domestic spending on what we call entitlement, social security funding for elderly people, for disadvantaged people. 
Um, and we have a lot of money spent on the U.S. military, around $880 billion a year. And so, you know, you can't really grow one without shrinking the other, given the size of the debt, even in the United States. And so I think there is an awareness that you've got to take that military budget. It needs to be the military needs to be modernized in order to compete with China. And then you've got to work out where you can spend it to create better, you know, more American influence with respect to values, but especially with respect to stability. And I think the, the American people broadly follow that. And they're, they're willing to then think hard about where to invest based on those, that basic set of parameters. But I think it would be wrong, again, to, to blame the American people <laughs> for what's coming out of the U.S. Congress and for some of the very negative politics about humanitarianism, about relief, about foreign assistance. It's not being driven the by the people. Uh, it's being driven house. by the political polarization, right? Mm -hmm. The polarization between the political parties and the divisions within the political parties, not the polarization in the American people. Okay. Or for people abroad to imagine that what you see on the streets necessarily reflects what people basin. are really thinking. That's right. Yes. Okay. That's right. Yeah. That that's a point that uh, because how does one gauge right? One gauges by uh, by the media coverage, and the media coverage is either the street or uh, these polls which are coming out. Yeah. And just before an election. Uh, us sitting in Asia, we just would probably see that. But I'm going to come, uh, Ajay, to you because we were talking about budgets. Pakistan, again, going to the IMF, their favorite child, that love affair doesn't mm -hmm. end. They've got, what, 23 bailouts uh, in the last count that I had. And they're asking for another bailout now. So, uh, and is the IMF going to give a, another bailout yet again? Absolutely. I, I think uh, Pakistan's economy is just unsustainable. And uh, 23 bailouts, as you said, and they, uh, the first task of the new government, whenever it's formed at the end of the month, will be to go to the IMF for the 24th. Yeah. And uh, this, um, in many ways, is worse than it ever was before. Because, you know, you might say, oh, it's the usual cycle, we'll go back to the IMF. Uh, the reason is that the accumulated errors of the past mm are now uh, coming home to roost. So what is happening is that this economic crisis is more severe than uh, any of the ones Pakistan has faced before. Or, and it comes on the back of uh, ecological crisis, uh, political crisis, as well as a security crisis. And all together is making Pakistan increasingly dysfunctional. And that's why this crown of thorns, when Shabazz Sharif gets it, it's not going to be easy for uh, because the first thing is to uh, is to get this IMF program and that means more belt tightening, more tough decisions on for a people who are already disillusioned by the political process where they voted for one man, but uh, another person is governing them, mm. and uh, it's it's not being taken care of. So it's it's a severe problem and um, Pakistan mostly fails to address the roots of this problem to undertake the kind of structural reforms on a sustained basis, which it needs to, which, for instance, India did in the 1990s, and move forward with those reforms, reforming uh, also the stranglehold that the army holds on the economy. Yeah. So the role of the economy, uh, army in the economy is also huge. And that uh, also becomes a destabilizing factor. So all that, those tough decisions are up ahead and it, it, it depends on whether Pakistan will actually be able to do it. So why, tell me, you just mentioned Shabazz as prime minister. Why did Nawaz Sharif come back if he didn't want to take the job of the, becoming the prime minister? He installs his daughter as chief minister of Punjab an important position and then he makes his brother yet again the prime minister when he's not been able to deliver in the first go so why did he come back at all well uh, there are many conspiracy theories <laughs> there but uh, but possibly you know he wanted to clear his name you know remember he was a fugitive from law uh, technically when he was in exile in london How is so he, he wanted to get all those cases cleared but more than that um, the expectation was that uh, the uh, engineering for the election would be of a standard where he would get a majority or a two-thirds majority. But absent that, he decided not to take this crown of thorns and uh, give it to his brother. So, you know, in a sense, 
uh, it wasn't a fully engineered election or an efe <laughs> efficiently engineered election. And uh, part of the reason may be that the army has thrice burnt its sands by getting Nawaz Sharif thrice. He that sounds like a poem in the or past, Shakespearean. Or it's very Shakespearean. <laughs> thrice he was offered the yeah. kingly crown. And um, each time he developed a mid-term mid itch and uh, contested the army and said, look, I have to run the country even though you got me here. And each time he had to be thrown out. So perhaps the army also didn't want to engineer it so well that uh, they get him for the fourth time and face this problem. The mm. more pliable brother is possibly uh, more suitable for the army. More pliable brother. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but um, if I was to come to and ask you about this, do you think Nawaz Sharif is going to go back to London or is it that uh, he didn't want this job as prime minister with a with a less mandate and having Zardari as president? That's an uncomfortable position because Zardari is probably in the pecking order more untrustworthy than even the army as far as Nawaz Sharif is concerned. Well, I think Nawaz probably got a limited ticket when he came back. They said, OK, you can come back. Um, we'll clear the problems. Hmm. Um, we'll help. We'll use the name. We'll do all the that and the other. But you're not going to be the person running the show. So that's the basis on which you're going to come back. Yeah. And that's what he accepted, I think. Uh, you spoke earlier about the diaspora in, yes. in, in UK. Yes. Um, you know, for India, the Pakistani diaspora in, uh, in, the, in UK as well as in the US, um, they are supporting the Khalistanis in, in, in UK as well as in the US. Uh, and it's become an issue because you have the Mirpuri population there. And uh, they are, uh, that's what the Indian um, um, Foreign Service says to uh, in their briefings, that there is a nexus between the two. So tell us how uh, that can be resolved because that becomes a niggling issue. Mm -hmm. If you see what's happened with India and Canada, the relationship got so, uh, so naughty uh, it's KNO. <laughs> well, I, I think you, to, to make a general point on this, I think you'll find that in a lot of the immigrant communities um, that extremism becomes more acute, that they become, particularly the next generation, the younger ones there, become easy prey uh, to those feeding extremist ideas. And of course, because of the nature of our countries, um, they can uh, freely develop these ideas. And so um, I don't think, if you look at the Sikh community in Britain, they're you know, well integrated, great lot of people. The Khalistan aspect of that is a very small minority, as of course it is here uh, among the Sikhs. So, again, I think you get an unrepresentative picture. If you're sitting in the Indian High Commission in London, you're looking out, you're seeing this big demonstration of Khalistan and all this nonsense, then um, you, you could imagine that it's got some widespread support. I'm saying, no, I don't think it has. So, um, and similarly, when we see these mass demonstrations on the streets about Gaza and all of that, this is, you know, the left and uh, certain younger elements uh, are out on the streets and easily mobilized because of social media. And of course, the sort of um, information they're getting through external satellite television and all of that. So um, I just you have to be very careful what you see in the media, um, crowds in the streets, or indeed the photographs and things like that. What I'm saying is I don't think it's representative. Yes. Additional factor is that a lot of the mischief we find is manufactured in Pakistan in Rawalpindi yes. that you see overseas. So, um, you know, when I was High Commissioner in Ottawa, I would have the Khalistani flags and the free Kashmir flags together. So it is really buy one, get one free. They hire the same people and um, often use them. So it's, it's a, there's a lot of artificial push to much of these uh, diaspora demonstrations. Yes, but now the diplomats, it's not just heckling. Uh, it's gone further than that, right? So uh, while it happened with you when you were there with Taranjit Sandhu, they got 
very close when he was ambassador out there and uh, the consulate in San Francisco was vandalized. So it's not just burning of the flag or anything. They got on to the Indian High Commission in London. So it gets the it's no longer just a protest demonstration. These are mobs which are getting now violent. They, they use fire. There is arson. The San Francisco consulate was attacked. And like you said, it's buy one, get one free. It's not just a handful of Khalistanis because how many Khalistanis are there? Very few. It's not the Sikh population. It's the Khalistanis in the Sikh population. Yeah. So th th that needs to be separated out. But it, it is getting... So one can't well, just say... the same with the, the Tamils in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka. You mm. see, exactly the same. You would imagine. And, you know, they have very good access and all the rest of it. But, you know, a disproportionate influence is being seen there. Mm. Uh, you know, you were saying that, uh, Leslie, you were saying that it's like the people is different, mobs separate government decisions separate, but increasingly the divisions are getting uh, diluted. Uh, social media influences everything. Social media, in and that's why you saw what happened at the Capitol also, right? And we are entering an election year again uh, in America. So m the mob influence is there. It is, it is determining uh, how people vote. So you're seeing more and more people in America not having confidence in the electoral system. And this is something that I mentioned in another uh, platform out here where I said that it's not, it's not a comfortable situation for younger democracies when you see such a large democracy like America where the people are dissatisfied with uh, not just an elected government but with the entire system of apparently, it. There is, apparently yeah. decided something. Well, I mean, yeah, I, you know, yeah. first of all, we do know from a number of uh, surveys, um, Edelman is one, but there are many others, Pew, that trust in government institutions is very low relative to other points, certainly in U.S. history. So this is the U.S. case. It's not just the social media. I think it's, it's you know, you're, you're Im implicitly, I think, pointing us to the, the bigger problem, which is the problem of misinformation, yeah. disinformation, interference. We all know this is very profound. We don't yet know. We didn't even know how to deal with it before, you know, Seems suddenly AI was on the scene. And now we have AI and the digitization of society. So it, what it does is it means that it's very much more difficult to have a measured sound, fact-based discussion about what America's foreign policy be, should be, what Pakistan's foreign policy should be. It's harder to engage the public consistently and at a high level because people are reading different papers, they're following different people on Twitter, they're getting different facts and they believe these facts quite. And it's not because they have the view based on facts that's different, it's that they have different facts. And that, that makes it very, very difficult to inform policy, whether it's on Pakistan or on, or on China or, or some other part of the world right now. It's on questions of Israel and, and Gaza. But I, I wanted to come back to one thing, mm -hmm. uh, which was this question of Pakistan coming to the IMF, because it, it comes into part of the policy debate in the U.S. And, and, and I guess I would say... Yes, and um, the international community, right? Wealthy, advanced, industrialized countries bear some responsibility for this too. It's not only a problem, it's clearly a problem of governance in Pakistan, but it's also a problem of rising interest rates, making servicing your debt much harder. Why are interest rates going up? Because, you know, the West, Western economies were spending more money and needed to raise their own interest rates. And we know the post COVID recovery story. So, there is a responsibility that sits outside of Pakistan as well. Certainly that's the case when it comes to the climate related effects mm. that developing countries are experiencing that the developed world bears responsibility for. So I think there is some traction in the U.S. Congress for spending more, for giving more to try and de-risk um, the investments of private the private sector, we need the private sector to make to assist um, Pakistan and other countries, uh, as well as giving di direct assistance. This is critical. I think we have to be very careful about letting, you know, the rest of the world off the hook when it comes to developing country debt and to climate, the climate transition and the experience of smaller countries 
uh, on the receiving end of, you know, the wealth and the wealthy industrialized world. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for. So, yeah. gentlemen and Leslie, thank you so much for being part of this discussion. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.